it stands to reason that if this is the case, right? I'll just make it, made this as a statement. It's the reverse of this derivative is the integral. Same thing here. If I see a fraction, the derivatives on the top of the function on the bottom, the denominator, then I can take that with respect to x. And this must have come from a log function. Namely, log of the denominator. OK, now I'm going to pause for a second. In a sense, this is all you need. Like, uh, exercise 12b is now laid open to you. You just, just go for it, OK? However, there's actually something dangerous here that I haven't bothered pointing out, which you kind of don't need to know as a 2 unit and extension 1 students. As extensions 2 students, you'll be expected to know. But what I'm about to show you is completely 2 unit and 3 unit. Like, there's no reason why you can't know it. So I want to show it to you. Some of you may see some textbooks, or you may have even encountered at other times before this class. Rather than log x, they write log of the absolute value of x. Okay, and then they, they have the plus c. And then in the same way, um, here, they say it's not just log of that function of the denominator, it's log of the absolute value of that denominator of that function. Okay? Now, there are two or well, three ways you can explain like why is, why do these absolute values appear? Okay? The first way is actually not an explanation at all. It's just to say, because you have to. Like it's magic. Because because math, okay, that's just the rule, just deal with it, okay? That's not an explanation, clearly, okay? There's one thing which is a bit better than that, which is to say, when you're taking log, this is base e, right? You can't just put any number you like in here, right? Log base e, the only numbers you can put in here are positive numbers, right? You can never grow and get negative. You can get really, really big. If you go backwards in time, you can get really, really, really small. But you can never go negative, so you, you can't put negative numbers in there. So some people will reason, since you can't put negatives in there, you slap absolute value signs in there. Now this is exactly the same as when we were dealing with areas, and it's like, yeah, just put absolute value signs because, because, right? It's still not an explanation. Like, who says I should be able to assume that that's going to be positive? Sometimes I can't. This function might be some weird thing that's sometimes positive, sometimes negative. That's not the real explanation. Here's the way the real explanation works. Look carefully at this statement. Do you agree that it is true? Are you happy with that? Do you remember how we proved it? It's wrong. As long as it's, it's not true at all, right? Well, not true at all. It's not true for all values of x. It's only true for what we just said, right? The log function only exists for x is greater than 0. Right? Whereas 1 over x, it exists for everywhere except for x equals 0. Right? It, it has its merry way over x is less than 0. So this statement is only true for x positive. Therefore, this, which is what I wrote down originally, is also only true for x positive. Okay? So it's kind of like, all right, now I have half the picture. How do I get the other half? How do I understand what is happening on this integral? And the answer is, just like we always do, I come back to differentiation. This is not obvious, but stay with me. You need to jot this down. If I differentiate, and I'm going to use this second thing, the chain rule, right? If I differentiate this, humor me, what am I going to get on the right hand side? It's not going to work on the calculator. I know it's not going to work on the calculator, <laughs> which is why I'm not using the calculator. This is a chain rule, so I should get f dash on f. What's f dash? What's f? Hmm. Hold on. Oh, completely I'm different function. This, do you agree, is a completely different function to this. But somehow, by going through this process, I get the same thing. And that actually makes a lot of sense, because when you have a look at, very quickly, when you have a look at the way the log function appears on a graph, right? Here's log x, right? Here is the part of the hyperbola, 1 over x, that tells me the derivative over here. That matches, doesn't it? Super steep at this point, and then it gets shallower and shallower and shallower. That agrees with what we, our intuition tells us. What does this tell us? What does log of minus x look like? How would you describe it? Where's it gone? Has it not flipped over yeah. to this side? It's come over this side. So this is what log of negative x looks like. What does 1 over x, the hyperbola, what does it look like over there? And the answer is it's in the opposite quadrant, right? Which, true enough, still matches. Like, look over here. The gradient of the log function over here is very, very shallow. 
right? And decreasing, and decreasing, and it's really steep decreasing. It makes sense that we get the same derivative for two completely different functions. Okay, so now I can make an integration statement from this. I can say, if I integrate 1 over x dx, right, um, I'm still going to get a log function, but I might get this function, awesome. not that one, in a different domain. Right? Okay, now, look carefully, let me put some big circles around them. Look at this line, and look at this line. See that? See they both start the same way? They're talking about the same integral, right? They're talking about this integral. But, depending on where you are, if you're negative or if you're positive, you get two different answers. You get, sometimes, log of x plus a constant. Where, where do you get that again? When x is positive. But, if you're somewhere else, if you are to the left of the y-axis, you'll get this guy. Now, look at that carefully, right? Stare really hard at it and forget the fact that there's logs here and plus c's here. x, negative x, for positive, for negative. I have some language to describe this, to take these two things absolute. and pull them into one. It's the absolute value of x. That's where it comes from, see that? Over here, it behaves like this. Over here, it behaves like that. It's doing two different things. That's why. Not just because I magically want positive numbers. It's because there are two completely different functions that coalesce into the same derivative. So when you go backwards, you've got to know where you are to know which anti, which primitive you should go to because you'll get different ones in different spots. When we end solve questions, should we write a formula with absolute Okay, so remember what I said at the beginning. That as a two unit or three unit student, you don't need to worry about this, okay? If you wrote this, when I wrote that, da, 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 that's, that's it, right? That's fine. You're more than often, more than likely, you're going to get some boundaries here. They'll be positive, and so you just evaluate this at the positives, right? No problems, okay? Extension 2 students are expected to do that right off the bat, okay? Does it make a difference if you're, like, solving stuff in extension 2? Is that why? Not really. It's just that we expect extension 2 students to get a bit more of the detail behind what's happening. But I hope you see as I explain that, like, everything I just established, like, there's no complex numbers in there, there's no, you don't know what they are yet, there's no conics, there's no weird stuff like that. It's all stuff that as two and three inch students we know. You make a statement about differentiation, and the statement about integration comes with it. And definitely two unit students, we know about absolute value, right? It's just a, a nice, neat, summarized form of two things into one. 